welcome to the Strategy and Leadership Podcast, the podcast that brings you practical advice, lessons, and stories from senior leaders and thought leaders from around the world. The Strategy and Leadership Podcast is brought to you by SME Strategy, working with organizations around the world to create and implement their strategic plans. To learn more, visit smestrategy.net. And now, your host, Anthony Taylor. Hey there, folks. Welcome to today's episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. Today, my guest is Scott Jeffrey Miller. He has quite the resume. So he is a Wall Street Journal bestselling author. He is the host of the world's largest leadership podcast. And he's the author of his sixth book, The Ultimate Guide to Great Mentorship. Boom. There it is right there. Scott Jeffrey Miller, how are you today? Anthony, I'm awesome. Thanks for the platform. Thanks for the spotlight. Excited to talk about mentorship with you today. I am so stoked. One of the things that we haven't even talked about was your 27 years at Franklin Covey, which is another whole thing that blows my mind because you've touched on such a cool areas. But why don't you give, and in addition to so, 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 so many other cool things, but why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about who you are, what, you know, psychs you up in the morning, and then we'll, we'll get into it. What psychs me up in the morning, getting my kids off to school. <laughs> so I live in Salt Lake City, Utah with my wife, Stephanie. We have three young sons that are eight, 11, and 13. I'm from Florida originally, worked for the Walt Disney Company for four years until they invited me to leave. And then so where does a single Catholic boy from Orlando, Florida move to? Well, Provo, Utah, back in 1996, where all the Catholics were. No, there wasn't a single Catholic in Provo, Utah 27 years ago, but Dr. Stephen Covey, of course, the author of the seminal book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, hired me and brought me out to Utah where, to quote you, I spent 27 years and worked from the front line to the C-suite, became the chief marketing officer and executive vice president of what is now the world's most influential and trusted leadership development firm, was the CMO for 10 years, three times the national average for a public CMO, retired from the firm in good standing about three years ago. I still am an ambassador for the company. I host what is the world's largest weekly leadership podcast called On Leadership with Scott Miller. I've authored six books, and um, I'd like to say I have a little bit of expertise around leadership, management, careers, and culture, and I'm excited to talk about mentorship. Hey, well, let me ask you, in the time that you've been doing this, and you see a lot of people, you talk to a lot of people, how would you characterize the evolution of leadership? And then I'm going to ask you about how mentorship fits in that. But at the yeah. time that you've been talking about it, writing yeah. about it, could you maybe take some snapshots in terms of how it's evolved from your perspective? Sure. I think leadership probably is unrecognizable now from even pre-COVID, not to mention 10, 20 years ago. There's a couple of, I think, evolutions that I would illustrate. One is not everyone should be a leader of people. I think too many organizations reserve the promotion, the increase in influence and compensation to those who are leaders. So too often organizations lure people into leadership. What happens in most companies is you promote the top individual producer, right? The most efficient dental hygienist to run the office or the most creative digital designer to be the director of the creative division or the top salesperson to become the sales leader. There's no correlation between being the sales producer and a sales leader. In fact, those skills are often inversely correlated. Not everyone should be a commercial airline pilot. Not everyone should be an anesthesiologist. And not everyone should be a leader of people. You should be very deliberate around, does this tap into what you truly want to do with your career? Or is it the only way to get a promotion? And I would let that sort of rest with some gravity on your listeners. Leadership is not the right track for everyone. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm never going to be an oral surgeon. I'm not sure I should have been a leader of people. And I was the top individual sales contributor. It was the only way to earn more money and move my way up into influence in the company. Secondly, post-COVID, I think everyone needs individualized leadership. People have different passions and traumas. People have different talents and skills and dramas. And now everyone is bringing their whole lives to work and they need a leader that can lead them effectively individually. I think it was common in years past where, you know, Anthony had a leadership style and everybody needed to kind of align to it or sort of cleave to it. That don't work no more. Now you have to lead the way all of your people want to be led. And that might be 15 different leadership styles. There are principles that govern human behavior. Those are common to all cultures, all religions, all companies, all industries, all countries. But beyond those principles of leadership, you know, how to treat people, don't gossip, keep confidences, listen more than you speak, 
check in, pay attention, show empathy. Those are principles of being a good human. But now leaders need to bring a level of engagement that wasn't, I think, before COVID even required of them. Mm. Well, one of the things that that struck me of the and I and I hadn't heard about it before, but I believe it to be true, is the you know the one size fits all leadership. You follow me, and and this kind of brute force. And as I look at kind of market forces, generally speaking, the increased individualization of everything yeah. you know yeah. you have your own ability to have your own uh have your own rights that sounded like the dumbest thing i've almost ever said <laughs> brand uh, website approach yeah and, and you know like hey i've got my customized news feed i've got all of these things well now people have their their expectations and the opportunity truly because of how the world has evolved for them to you know, meet their respective needs. And I think that, as you've said it, as leaders, for them to continue to be successful, it's the expectation of the consumer, in this case, the employee, right. that you need to be able to match that up. And so I guess, you know, segueing into my second question from before was like, that's the difference between leadership, I'm telling you all, and mentorship, hey, I'm supporting you on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And I think it's an important distinction. H how do you view the distinction between leadership and mentorship? I think actually they have very little in common. Okay. I honestly think that that because you're a great leader does not mean you're a great mentor. I think most mentors are probably leaders by the sheer nature of longevity, their wisdom, their tenure, their experience. I'm often asked in podcast interviews to talk about reverse mentorship. And I say, yeah, there's no such thing. Mentorship is mentorship, age ag ag agnostic. It's about helping someone guide them towards what they want to accomplish following you know, the 13 roles that I talk about in my book. But to your point, I think, you know, great, great leaders can be great mentors, but there isn't a one-to-one -one correlation. When I think of a leader, I think of lots of talents, including someone who is typically quite decisive, someone who probably accelerates and processes information, you know, fairly fast, someone who is in persuasion mode, in influence mode, in selling mode, not all the time, someone who can actually peel the onion and get to the root cause in very quick fashion. Those can be great leadership skills. Mm. Those typically aren't great mentorship skills. If you believe that your job as a mentor is to help your mentee progress what is her or his goal, which may have nothing to do with your journey, it may not be your goal. They likely have a different personality and experience than you do, then you have to often exercise an unnatural level of patience. Mm. Yes, that can be said for great leaders. But I, when I think of a leader who's running an organization, they usually have a bias to action. Yes, they have empathy. Yes, they need patience. But they also have goals that have to be accomplished regardless. And so I think it's important to differentiate between mentors and leaders, coaches, allies, champions, supporters. Those are different. Mentors are not always your leader. In fact, rarely should your leader, I think, be your mentor. It happens sometimes, but rarely. And I don't think mentorship is about being your ally or supporter or champion. Your mentee might earn through their demonstration of making and keeping commitments and being trustworthy and showing growth. They might earn you into becoming their ally, but it's not the role you start out in as a mentor. Got it. As I think about your journey and you said, hey, CMO, three times longer than the national average. What were some of those things that what was one of the lessons you learned potentially the hard way about being a leader or a mentor um, in your own personal journey? Oh, Anthony, everything I've learned is the hard way, brother. I haven't learned anything <laughs> the easy way in life. Trust me. Starting with algebra, okay, uh, which I never learned. I just kept failing it and kept being, you know, on restriction for my parents, different podcasts. I've learned a lot in my day, right? Obviously being tutored of some of the biggest names in the business. I'll tell you, I think the biggest learning I had was from the CEO who probably is my mentor, not formally, informally. And as the chief marketing officer of the Franklin Covey company, obviously I was a member of the executive team and reported the CEO, a man of impeccable integrity, you know, Harvard MBA, Super handsome, super trustworthy, super competent, you know, climbed the Matterhorn, you know, done the Iron Man 40 times. I'm not kidding you. Okay, 30, but close enough. And we have nothing in common. He's very deliberate, very patient, very focused. I'm very impatient, impetuous. We have nothing in common. One day after an executive team meeting, Anthony, we break. And he walks past me on the way to the restroom. And when I say restroom, I mean question, quotation marks, because he probably just needed a break. He walked past me and he said, Scott, you make too many declarative statements. And he left his office. 
Now that was his way of a both having an intervention and probably avoiding conflict and not wanting me to, you know, ask him 10 questions, but it was a powerful statement because what he was really saying is Scott, you can be a jackass. You're always the first to answer the questions. You're always first to weigh in. You're always right. You have an opinion on everything and you never ask any questions. You always just state facts that are often your opinions. Stop conflating your experiences, your emotions, and your opinions with facts. Mm. What he really said was, Scott, you make too many declarative statements. It was a watershed experience for me. I didn't need to ask him to unpack that. I knew. <laughs> yeah. And I think it fundamentally changed my ratio of listening to speaking. It changed my style of conflating my opinions and presenting them as facts. It stopped me always raising my hand to be the first one to weigh in on initiative or a strategy or a vote. And I became a little more patient listening to the wisdom and positions of others, including if I still vehemently disagreed with them, I just weighed in as the seventh person, not always the first. Hmm. A powerful 13 words. And you don't need to say more when you have, like, it sounds like both a, a tremendous respect and I think he respected a lot of you because I don't think he would have said something like that. And I think yes. that the, from, from the folks that I see, especially young leaders, and when I say young, I don't necessarily mean they're not of age. It means that they don't have the experience. It can be confronting to be able to deliver such a profound and impactful yeah. and helpful statement for fear of conflict. Well, I, by the way, that was one of his, his personality traits is, is he doesn't like conflict. Now, back him into a corner and you will lose. Do not back him into a corner. But I think I had also done something which you're kind of alluding to, which was he knew I could handle it, right? We had developed trust and rapport where he could, I don't want to say slam me, but he could right size me to quote you in 12 or 13 words without me losing, you know, my self-esteem or me, you know, punishing him or me taking my toys metaphorically and going home. I think I had set the conditions where he knew I could take it because hmm. he didn't speak that way to other people. Now he said it in a very respectful way. This guy is my hero. I love this man. I would give him a kidney tomorrow. Again, we have very little in common. He's driven me crazy. Oh, I can assure you I've driven him crazy, but we have a healthy respect for each other. I think he knew I could handle it, which is why he said it so straight, straight talk to me. Yeah, no, I get that. So let, let's, uh, if we look at our listeners who may be those experienced or not experienced leaders who are mentally just trying to still grappling with your original statement, leadership and mentorship have very little to do with each other. They are distinct yeah. skills and experiences. And if they are wanting to evolve on the path of being better mentors for their people, so providing an individualized yes. experience versus a group take it or leave it experience, uh, what are what are two or three kind of practices they could take in place? What are two or three considerations they should uh, embody as they move, you know, either in terms of summer reflection while they pick up your book and read it thoroughly cover to cover or uh, just bring it into their next team meeting? So the book is called The Ultimate Guide to Great Mentorship, The 13 Roles to Making True Impact. Rule number one is the revealer. As the revealer, you recognize your job is to help your mentee accomplish their goal. They come to the mentor session or they come and say, hey, you know what? I'm thinking about being a patent attorney or an orthopedic surgeon. Okay, those are different paths. <laughs> Let's talk about those. So your job is to uncover so that they can discover, which requires you to really probably flip the number of percentages you spend speaking versus listening. As in 80-20, as a leader, you probably talk 80% of the time and listen 20% of the time, statistically. Hmm. The mentor, I think you flip those and you listen 80% and speak 20%. The second component of the first role, which is the revealer, is to become hyper aware of what it's like to be in a mentoring session with you. What's it like to be on the receiving end of feedback from you? What's it like to be led by you? What's your voice inflection, your rate, your tone, your pitch, your energy, your hand gestures? What's your physical energy like? How intimidating is it to be in a conversation with someone of your level of success or wealth or education or title? Don't underestimate how intimidating your vocabulary and word choice can be. 
Secondly is don't ever break the golden rule of mentorship, which is never say, well, if Anthony, I, if I were you, I would do this. No, you're not them. You don't have Anthony's talents and Anthony's fears. You have your own. Do not live vicariously through your mentee. Do not try to accomplish the things you wished you could have or would have through your mentee. You instead say, well, Anthony, you know, once when I was faced with a similar opportunity, here's how I worked through it. That may or may not be relevant to how you should work through it. Let's talk about how I worked through it. And if there's anything to tease out of that for you, let's kind of develop or, you know, delve into that. But let's talk more about how you should approach it. What is the upside and downside? What are the strengths and weaknesses of how you might approach it? I think that's super important. Most of all, I think it's also valuable that as a mentor, you set boundaries in as the leader. Role number two, the boundary setter. That you have an uncomfortable conversation up front to say, hey, Anthony, looking forward to this mentoring opportunity. Let's talk uncomfortably for three minutes. Anthony, here's some things that I don't intend to play as your mentor, right? I'm not your best friend. I'm not your ally or champion. I'm not your private equity funder. I'm not your Rolodex. Please don't ever put me in a situation that might ask me to do those things because that will be embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a leader and you're a mentor, those things might cross because as a leader, you probably should be the champion and ally and referent point for your for your mentor or for your mentee. That's why I think they often are different roles. I generally advise people not to ask their leader to also be their mentor. It can mm. happen. It's usually rare. Yeah, I get that. Well, I, I know that we uh, you're running low on time. I just a question that's just going to pop in my mind is: Do you have you ever experienced people who say, "Well, which am I? Am I a leader?" Am I a mentor? Am I both? Like, how do I make yeah. that distinction? Yeah. And is is it a choice? Yeah. I want to clarify because I'll bet if I were to go back and name my 15 leaders in life, I'll bet to some extent they were all mentoring me. Okay. That does not mean that I designated them as my mentor, that I walked up to them and said, hey, Anthony, would you mentor me once a month for the next nine months on a topic of how do I get into law school or how do I become a vice president? That can happen. My recommendation is that you don't have your leader become your mentor. They naturally might play that role informally for you, but I'd argue that you kind of keep that a little bit separate because no doubt I've been mentored by all of my leaders informally. And by the way, let me just clarify the definition of mentorship. I think it's how you define it because my greatest mentor in life is a guy I never met and he mm -hmm. never met me. A guy named Bruce Williams that hosted a very popular financial business radio talk show back in the 80s. I listened to it every night. It was called The Bruce Williams Show. I learned how to read a PL on the radio laying in bed as a junior high school student. I learned about how to buy a home, how to buy mortgage insurance, when to use an attorney, how to invest in inheritance. Nerd alert, I know. Bruce Williams died having no idea Scott Miller was even alive. Someday going to write a book called The Ultimate Guide to Great Mentorship and talk about him on your podcast. Redefine what mentorship looks for you. It may well not be your leader. It might be your leader that is a previous leader and you go back to her or him and say, hey, would they mentor you now? I just think it puts you in a difficult, puts your mentor in a difficult position to separate those roles of both firing you and mentoring you, of promoting you and mentoring you. Be careful about putting your mentor into an uncomfortable position that she or he may not want to be in. Yeah, no, that's that's well said. And so much to learn, so much to think about. Any a final piece of advice for our listeners as they evolve in their leadership, as they evolve in their mentorship, and yeah. as they are being mentored, 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 themselves yes. as they look at the growing, evolving their career, and then we'll finish up. Well, I think you should be both, right? I don't know anyone that's had enormous success in their personal life or professional life that hasn't named the mentors in their life, sometimes formally, sometimes informally. My call to action would be is make sure you always have a formal mentor. That means you've asked them, Anthony, I'm really trying to increase my influence, and my reputation. I really admire how you've built yours. Could you mentor me you know, three or four times, maybe for 45 minutes over the next three or four months on things I could do to build my credibility and my influence inside this company. Notice I set some parameters. I said three or four times once a month, then mm. stick to those. Always have a mentor. And I think at the same time, you are a mentee. 
I think as a mentor, when you're finishing up your sessions, you want to share not just what your mentee learned and their growth, share your own as well, because as the mentor, you're learning from your mentee. It's reciprocal all the time. Don't go into mentorship thinking you're just going to impart your wisdom and genius and fix your mentee. No, but look for ways to become more self-aware, become more influential, to figure out how does or does not your style, your natural personality style resonate with different mentees. I think self-awareness is the key to becoming an influential leader and mentor. Awesome. I love that. I think we can all become more self-aware. And I think as someone being, if you're looking for a mentor, tour the parameters around what that looks like what that means the specificity and i think one of the other key takeaways is you know don't put them in an uncomfortable spot um you know really support them in helping you because you don't want your mentor to eventually fire you because that could be um, awkward and challenging and that's a super great insight because i don't know that mentors always are willing to move outside of their comfort zone and discuss the undiscussables that's why i said and I, when I role played, hey, Anthony, let's have like a three minute uncomfortable conversation and then we'll go back to being comfortable. I think it's important to set some parameters here, some boundaries so that neither of us are ever being asked to do something that we have to say no to. That requires a little bit higher courage on the front end to make sure you're never set into a, you know, an awkward conversation. You have to unwind or say, yeah, I'm not comfortable doing that or, or, then, or agree to do it and then resent your mentee when you're really resenting yourself by not setting the boundaries up front. Oof. All right. That's just good. That's just good relationship advice, independent of being a mentor. Yeah, absolutely. No, I got that. Well, uh, thank you so much, Scott. It's been super fun. I know we could probably talk for a really long time. Uh, Where can people learn more about you and of course, pick up your newest book? Sure. The book is available at all bookstores, both online and bricks and mortar. You can visit greatmentorship.com where I actually have an online mentor certification program and a mentor kit. And you also can visit scottjeffreymiller.com to learn about all my books and all my podcast um, episodes as well. Amazing. Scott, thank you for being here today. I super appreciate it. It was really fun and uh, hopefully not too humbling of an experience uh, as that interview went on. (laughs) Thank you, Anthony. You're great. I love your voice. You have like a legitimate podcast radio voice. Never stop. Keep Uh, going, brother. I appreciate that. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. My guest, Scott Jeffrey Miller, who is the author of The Ultimate Guide to Great Mentorship, his sixth book available now. One of the things that I think is so critical is everybody talks about leadership. They talk about being a great leader and having people follow them. At the same time, wanting to bring in empathy, comfort, support, and really helping people to get to where they want to go. And I rarely hear people talk about mentorship. So I see it as a pathway to make significant and lasting impacts to the people around you and you might not even know who you're mentoring because that's how powerful great mentees are and really you know being able to do that by providing spaces for people to be successful but also boundaries so that it maintains the integrity of the relationship so thank you again scott for being my guest today this has been the strategy and leadership podcast i'll see you next time Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider giving us a review. We appreciate you listening and following along, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. And as Anthony says, until next time.